So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Laura, for speaking again. I know you've spoken in the past, so it's always great to have you back in another event. Um, so Laura Vaughn loves combining creativity with structure and process. With hands-on experience in strategy, finance, culture development, HR, manufacturing, and sales, and the battle scars to go along with it, equipping managers to thrive in their roles is Laura's purpose and her passion. None of us succeed alone, and watching the people around her find their best has been Laura's greatest privilege as a leader, entrepreneur, teacher, and mom. Thanks again for speaking today, Laura, and good luck with the presentation. My pleasure. Thank you, Alex, for the great introduction. And uh, a, a quick correction. My session description today says that I'm going to be speaking on the abundant workplace, but actually uh, I'm not. I'm going to be speaking about the change leader and specifically the controller as a change leader. And I want to start by telling you about my friend Bob. Bob is a controller. He's a controller at a manufacturing company. He's surrounded by a team of senior leaders, probably much like you. And these Senior leaders, they've all had a conversation about how they know they need new technology. They need a new ERP system. Now, Bob has explained why we need this change. Everybody agrees. They all see the need. They all see how this technology is going to make the company better. They agree the timing's right. And yet, three months later, Bob shows up at his project team meeting and discovers an empty room. He sits at the boardroom table alone. And he's waiting. He's waiting for his team to appear, but they never do. We're here today to talk about change. And specifically, I want to talk about the change leader. So you as controllers, you're very often the voice in your company that initiates change. Do, do you agree with this? Do you see this? You're often the trigger point. And the reason you're the trigger point is because you're the ones who are often presenting the gap. You're making other people aware of the gap. You're pointing out the gap between what we want, what we expected, and what we experienced. You're making us aware of this gap. And so you're often also looked to as the person who makes sure that this gap gets closed. Most CEOs I work with really want this from their controllers. They don't just want their controllers to identify, to point out the gap. What they want is your help to close it. They actually need your help to close it because very often our CEOs, our senior leaders, they, they don't have the capacity to close that gap. They don't, they don't have the attention to detail to make sure that highly complex projects get done in an orderly fashion. And so in, in Bob's story, this was his story. He was looked to as the person who could help close the gap, help make our company more efficient. We are, we are dragging, there's too much waste. Our technology is like a boat anchor, dragging along the bottom of the ocean with us. And he's the controller, but he's leading an ERP implementation. I've seen controllers leading efficiency projects. I've seen controllers leading pricing projects. I've seen controllers leading CRM implementations. And I'm pretty sure None of us, none of you as controllers want to be Bob. We don't want to be Bob. We don't want to see the project drag on. We don't want to be in a position where we can't get commitment from people just to do the things that need doing. And maybe the project ultimately dies a slow death. You've probably seen that in some organizations. More likely is that a project that we should be able to do in three months ends up taking three years. And we're fatigued. We're sick of it. And it's just like, we just would like to close the door on that one so we can open the door on something else. We're talking about highly disruptive projects. These are high stakes projects. They're not meaningless. We're not, and we're not doing them for fun, right? We're doing them because we wanna get some benefit. We wanna improve our financials. We wanna improve our, our efficiency. We wanna have better reporting information. We want things to be better. There's a goal going in, but if we're Bob, we can't get those benefits. We don't wanna be Bob, but I see it all the time. And it happens because we as leaders, dare I say, especially as financial leaders, are often not well versed in the language of change, in the human side of change. We are often not, we're not exposed to it in the, as, we, as we grow through our roles or certainly in our education. So we underestimate. Because we're not exposed to it, we have a tendency to underestimate the human side of change. We have a tendency to underestimate what we're actually asking of the people around us. When we lay out the tasks and the steps, we don't, we don't appreciate how hard that is for some of the people around us. 
So I want to help you understand what's going on inside those people's heads. Why does Bob's situation happen? And what can we do to not be Bob? Now, before I go any further today, I got to warn you that I am probably, I am probably going to use the F word. I am definitely going to use the F word. Now, you very professional, highly technical people, you might be a bit uncomfortable with that. So I'm warning you in advance that if I'm going to help you to not be Bob, I have to talk about feelings. And you thought I was going to use the other F word. What kind of establishment do you think this is? I wouldn't use the other F word in a speech like this. Take a moment. Before we go on, we're talking about change. I want you to think about two changes in your life. On the one hand, I want you to think about a change that at the time you found really exciting and positive. Maybe it was a promotion. Uh, maybe, it, maybe you moved. Maybe it was the birth of a child. Something exciting that you would say that was a really positive change. And on the other hand, the opposite. I want you to think about a change that at the time, eh, one, of my, one of my less proud moments in my life. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's the loss of a job. Maybe it's the you know deterioration of a relationship or a marriage. The thing about change, if you had asked me if change is good after I've been promoted, what would I have said? I would have given you a resounding, absolutely, change is good. But if my husband had said to me, Oh, Laura, change is good. The day I walked through our door with a termination letter in my hand, I might have thrown something at him. And it wouldn't have been the lettuce. It would have been something much, much heavier than lettuce. The thing about change is that our perspective of it is constantly shifting, right? It's not, it's not the same. Depending on what lens we're looking through, our view of change changes. My getting fired was certainly a negative in my world. But what about my boss? <laughs> Probably a positive for him, right? His lens is different. If we're being really honest with ourselves, we have to admit that not all change is good. Different people will respond to the different initiatives that you're leading in different ways. And our job as leaders is to understand as much as possible where they're at. Where are our people at and how do we meet them there? Because if we don't do it, we don't get the benefits of change. And we are all about pursuing benefits, tangible, economic, financial benefits of change. We can't get there unless we understand what our people are going through. And this is a process. We can put an order of operations to this. We can follow some steps as we help people navigate change in the same way we can follow steps to get the right technology in place, to get our efficiency improved, there's a process to this. And we, we owe it to ourselves to follow a process because if our people can't navigate the change we are asking them for, then we are Bob. If we want benefits, we gotta think this through. So I want you to think about navigating the human side of change starting early and staying steady with it. It's consistency that matters, not big epic gestures. So every project you start has a journey to it, right? A set of steps, a set of phases. Rob had a set of steps too. He was gonna uh, in initiate, kick off the project. He's gonna design the system, then we're gonna build, and then we're gonna go live. What Bob was missing is an understanding of how the people around him would behave as he went through these different steps. The thing we forget when we initiate change, organizations don't change. People change. People do. The only reason anything ever gets done in your organization is because a person decided it would be done. Either today in this moment or yesterday when we created some automation for it. And as people, we also don't just change. We move through change. We, wait. we don't wake up one morning as a completely different person, much as maybe we wish we could some days. We, we, we transition. We move slowly from one type of behavior to the next, from one attitude to the next. And this is universal for us as human beings. And a man named William Bridges identified this transition for us and gave us a model for understanding what happens. So he's got three stages in his model. And the first of the three is the first thing that happens when we face a change is the realization that something is dying. Something is ending, we are letting go, something is going away. And because of the ending, 
it brings out feelings, emotions. We are shocked. We are angry. What do you mean I've been fired? How dare you? Or we're in denial. This isn't happening. No, this isn't. I, I can get through this. This, is, this isn't a big deal. I can get through this. We're being forced to let go of something that we are comfortable with, that we've come to get used to, that we've come to enjoy, that we've come to be very good at. And we have to accept that that something is ending before we can accept a new idea. Now, there's a popular belief out there that if we're choosing a change, rather than having it imposed upon us, that we don't go through this, this ending, though, that that doesn't happen. That's a myth. Now, I want you to think back for a minute. Think about the two changes. The good one, the positive one, and the not so positive one. In both of those, you can probably see what was ending. In both of those situations, we had things, you had things that you had to let go of. Anybody here have kids? Probably. Do you remember being shocked, angry, fearful, sad, or in denial about what you were having to change in your life? I sure do. I remember in those first few weeks, or, or I can't remember how long it was in actually, maybe maybe six weeks or something like that. I was walking through the house and I walked by a card that somebody had sent us when our first child was born. And on the front of the card, it said, congratulations on your bundle of joy. And I saw this card and I burst into tears because this thing that showed up in my house is not a bundle of joy. And suddenly there's a card telling me that it should be. And it was the furthest thing from it. Just because I chose the change didn't make it any less difficult to let go. I still had stuff that ended. And I still had to work through the process of accepting it. It's a universal experience. Something has to go away for a new thing to emerge. Now, as time passes, we start to understand what we're letting go of and why we go through this phase of, of confusion. But, you know, we're, we're feeling a little better. We're not so angry and resentful anymore, but things are still a little foggy. It's like a twilight zone. You've let go of the old ways, but haven't quite figured out. I know that I'm not, you know, I'm responsible for another life now, but I haven't quite figured out how to, what does life look like as a mom? I don't know, I can't really figure that out. Or in a new ERP system, I've let go of the old process, but I can't quite figure out how to get my way through the, through the new one. I get that I'm not gonna do it that way anymore, but what, how do I do it this way? I don't quite get it. We're in like this stage of uncertainty, this excuse me, twilight zone, and we're skeptical. We haven't quite accepted that the change is gonna be good yet. We're still like, hmm. You think about the first 30 to 60 days of a new job, right? We're drinking from the fire hose. We think we like it here. Yeah, I think I'm going to, yeah, right? We're like, uh, I'm a little skeptical. There was that thing somebody said in that meeting the other day. I kind of a little spidey senses went up and went, uh, this is a, something's funny here. We haven't quite figured out all the politics, the culture, the guardrails of our role. So there's a sense of like off balance and a little disoriented. And then at some point we make our way through that and we start ah, to settle in. We feel a sense of acceptance. We start to see how we're capable. Oh yeah, you know what? I, I think I can do this. I, some energy comes in where we're like, I can see, you know, I've had a couple of quick wins and I can see that I kind of have the skills I need. I, I am capable. I am in the right place. This is, oh, I could do this. You know what they need here? Oh, I get, what if? this sense of opportunity occurs to us. And so we're in, we're into the other side, we're into the new beginning, we're committed. Now, let me ask you a question. Does this curve look just a little bit like the story of your life starting in March of last year? It certainly looks like mine. March of last year, I have had fear, shock, anger, even over the existence of COVID and the impact it's having on my life, I went through all the emotions trying to understand this change that's being imposed upon me. Initially, I was in complete denial. I can do all of this. I can push through. I can, I can homeschool and work full time and stay completely isolated. And it's okay. I got this. And then a couple of weeks of lockdown, I'm like, I have not got this. What the heck 
is this? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know where to go. I, I like, I, 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 why am I so frustrated? Why am I so angry all the time? Why am I so lost? I, I don't know how to get my work done anymore. Right. Trying to juggle all the demands. And a lot of times what happens is we also face in the neutral zone, an increased workload and a decrease in productivity. You probably early on in the COVID days saw your workload go way up government subsidies and reforecasting and trying to figure out what are we going to do? How are we going to stay alive? But your productivity maybe did not. So you're juggling those two things. And then somewhere different timing for all of us, we came into the new beginning phase and we started to get, you know what, there's opportunity here. There are some upsides to working from home. Look at all the family time I'm getting or look at what I can do with my evenings that I couldn't do before. This model happens to on every change you encounter. Every change that people around you encounter, it's the same. And when we as leaders are asked to initiate and champion a change, this is what's happening with the people around us. And the job is to not just go through the steps and stages of the project. It only makes sense to do that if we can ensure that the people around us are moving through this transition. Maybe I should point this way as quickly as possible. Because organizations don't change, people do. Nothing gets done unless your people decide to do it. Now, we don't get to skip phases. We always will go through all three phases. But what we can do as, as leaders, the impact we can have is how quickly do they move through. That is our goal. We can't skip. We can't get them straight to new beginning. But we can help them get through as quickly as possible. So that's what we want to do. That is what great change leaders are doing. They're intentional about helping people move through these stages, which means they get the benefits from their change initiatives more quickly. So I'm going to categorize these tools and activities into four phases. I'm going to talk about listening, clarifying, preparing, and support. This is what our people need from us as they make their way through this transition. They need us to listen. They need us to clarify. They need us to prepare them, and they need us to support them. Step one is listen. So I'm gonna explain to you, first of all, the kinds of questions we should be asking in this stage. And then the speech bubble is like, this is the genesis of the conversation. These are the, this is the nature of the conversations we need to be having. So the first thing we do when we initiate change, we gotta, we gotta listen. We gotta just slow down for a minute and listen. We're in stage one, people are, are what? They're, they're angry. They're losing something. They're trying to figure out what they're losing. Sometimes they don't even know what they're losing, but they're pretty sure they're losing something. And sometimes they're making up stuff, right? <gasps> I'm losing my job. I'm gonna lose my best friend. I'm gonna lose, I'm losing, losing, losing. I'm losing control. I'm losing predictability. We don't always know. And sometimes they don't even know what, they're, what they think they're losing. And that's why we gotta listen. Where do they feel like they're losing control? or their comfortable routine or their job? What do they think they're losing? And we can probably think that through without even asking them, but it's better if we ask. What do you think this change means for you? What are you worried about? What concerns you about that? What are they feeling most intensely? Is it fear? Are they in denial? Are they hurt? Right? Is something about this change making them feel like you know, if the, if the person who created the old ERP system is seeing it get ripped out and replaced, well, maybe it's not about fear or denial at all. Maybe it's just like, I spent so much time and effort on that thing, right? Where are they at? And what uncertainty, what specifically is at the root of all of the fear, the sadness, or the denial, wherever they are? What's at the root of it? Can we find where the actual root cause is? A lot of times they won't know. And here's the thing, controllers. You actually don't care about the answers. I'm not telling you to ask these questions because you need to know the answers. I'm telling you to ask these questions because your people need to know the answers. Your job is to make sure they process. That's what gets them through. That's what gets them through the ending zone is doing the work of understanding their own fears. You're not asking because I want you to deal with their fear or their sadness. No, you're asking because you want them to deal. You want them to process what's going on. So the, ner the nature of our conversations in this stage is really, we're asking one question, what concerns you about this? Oh, interesting. Yeah, what, what concerns you about that? 
oh, interesting. Really? You're, you're starting to worry you're going to lose your job? What, what makes you think that? What about this makes you think that? We, we, don't, we don't necessarily need to do anything about it. All we're doing is making sure they're processing the endings because we recognize that something is ending. They know it too. They just can't articulate it. They can't quite put it into words. So that's our listen stage. And the next stage, as we listen and people process and they come to terms with what's changing, I don't get to go out in the evenings anymore. I have this little life that is completely dependent on me and I miss my, my, miss my day job. I miss my work. Great. Cool. And the more we process it and put words around it, the more capable we are of letting it go. And that's what we need. We need people to let go of the old. And then we can move them into the neutral zone, which is all about clarity. What we, what we need, what our people need for us here is to clarify. Because remember, the neutral zone is like the twilight zone. We're, we're walking around dazed and confused going, I, I, I can't figure out what my job is anymore. I don't know. In an ERP implementation, in Bob's story, this is like the design and build stages of the project. The workload's increasing. There's, we're starting to get a sense of what things are going to look like, but we haven't quite figured out what's changing and what isn't. We're, we're off balance. And so we got to help people by clarifying. We got to understand where are you confused? What's missing for you? What are the gaps? And here we actually do want to know the answers if we're in charge of leading the project, because it's going to affect sort of that that infrastructure side of the project, right? It's gonna affect the way we design, the way we build and, and so on. Where are you confused? What specifically, we gotta talk a little bit about resistance. This is where a lot of times resistance shows up. I don't like this and when, when I don't like this, it's often just because I don't understand it yet. I haven't figured out how it's gonna work in my world. Is it a physical change that they're resisting? Is it a process change? Is it a workload? Resistance always has legitimate stuff beneath it. We just got to peel it back a little, figure out what it is. And then what do we know that we, they don't know? We have to recognize that as change leaders, we always have the most information. We always have more information than the people around us. And sometimes we forget the difference between what we know and what we've communicated. And so can we bring a sense of clarity? How, where, what can we tell them that we know that is going to help with some of the confusion and the disorientation? And we can ask our conversation, what else do you, would you like to know? What else would you like to know about this project? What else would you like to know? What else would you like to know? And some of the things, obviously you're not gonna know everything. There's, there are limits, right? There's uncertainty in every project. But the more we can give people a sense of uh, uh, um, something they can hang on to about what the future is gonna look like, the faster they'll move through that neutral zone. All right, gotta talk a little bit about resistance. Tell me, do you think, are people fundamentally resistant to change? Is that a basic human trait? You've answered the question in your head, even if you haven't thrown it in the chat channel. Most people, when I ask this question, they say, yeah, people are just fundamentally opposed to change. And I'm inclined to mostly agree with that because resistance at its root is us protecting. It's protecting our frame of reference, our beliefs. So when we were told to isolate, each time we're told to isolate, we resisted on some level because we're protecting our values, our beliefs about community and family. Even the very best changes will trigger resistance. So what I want you to understand about resistance, A, it's normal. We're supposed to resist when something important gets challenged. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to fight for what we believe in. That's how, we, that's how we're wired as human beings. That's how change happens. That's how everything good in the world comes about. So resistance is normal and it's also a sign of health. It's a sign that your people care. It's a sign they have an opinion and an opinion means they're engaged in your workplace. In fact, when there's no resistance, you should be worried. Resistance is also a function of disruption. It's a sign that we're doing something different. We're shaking it up and that's a good thing. We crave stability, but it's disruption that makes us better. It's chaos that forces us to grow. Resistance is not always logical. We can understand something logically, intellectually, and still resist it. Think COVID. <laughs> we understand it. We get it. 
we just don't like it. And I'm going to find ways to not have to fit in that little box if I can. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's hardly ever personal, even though we like to make it personal. It's hardly ever personal and it's cyclical, reducing uh, resistance. It's not a one and done activity. You don't address someone's resistance and then move on. It's like always there beneath the surface and different things will bring it alive again. So when we're in the neutral zone, we're all about clarity. Our people need us to clarify for them. And then we move out of that. We start to move toward new beginnings. We're not quite there yet, but here we got to help our people prepare. They're starting to get a better sense of where we're going and we got to give them what they need. What do they need to succeed? What tools, what knowledge, what time do they need to be successful? Can they control their own learning? And what feedback can we get from them as they learn? What else do you need to succeed is the basic conversation we're having as people start to navigate out of their neutral zones and into the new beginnings. And lastly, we're going to support. And this is the one, I don't know why we struggle so much with this in our organizations, but we just have such a hard time acknowledging success, acknowledging progress. So here, people need our support. We're moving into new beginnings. We got to encourage them. We're spreading acceptance and, and energy. It's, it's coming, right? People are starting to embrace and we want to pour into this. We want to remind everybody of where they've been. All these new skills and this knowledge, it's turning into habits. Here, we want to be looking at where are people succeeding? What benefits are we getting as an organization? And how do we celebrate and acknowledge? The conversation here is look how far we've come. Look at all the stuff you're doing today that you didn't think you could do yesterday. That's what support means. Now, if this feels like more work than you want to do, I want you to know it's worth it. I want you to understand there's a huge upside to this. ProSci is the leading organization on change management. They research the impact of change. And they have done a study on what is the likelihood if we pay attention to the people side of change, how much more likely are our projects, our change initiatives to succeed? Two times, three times, what do you think? Take a guess. The research says, that we are actually six times more likely to exceed if we do a little bit of this along the way. The companies that said they were excellent at doing this, 93% of them achieved their or exceeded their objectives of their project. If we're being really honest with ourselves, we have to admit that all change is not good. Not all change is good. And it's this variation in how change impacts us and has impacted us in the past that makes it so necessary. We gotta pay attention to what people are going through as we ask them to do different, if we don't wanna be Bob. You are asked not just to identify the gap, but to help close the gap and paying a little more attention to how people are navigating the ask for something different can help us close the gap more quickly. This is a process. It's not all about hugs and pats on the back. It's about questions, asking really good questions. And it can help the individuals around you transition through change more quickly so that you don't have to be Bob. I thank you very much for joining me today. We have a few minutes. I don't know if Alex is back or not, can't tell. Um, but if you have a question, you can throw it in the chat channel and, uh, uh, or a comment, please happy to hear, um, your comments, what, what, what you heard today that was surprising, anything you didn't like, happy to hear that too. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Can you... Yeah. Okay, great. Because I, I just have to the session in a few minutes, so I just want to make sure I could get a chance to say thank you for speaking today. Uh, I know you speak, uh, it's always great to have you at another event. Um, thank you. For anyone watching, you know, if you have any questions for Laura, feel free to put them in chat. 
you know, make use of her time here and your time here as well. Ask some questions. She definitely has some great information for you guys. So definitely take uh, advantage of the situation here. And just ask any questions uh, that you might have about you know, her presentation or anything that you kind of thought of or anything like that. Um, I did have one quick question. Um, where can people reach you if they want to follow up with you maybe after the event? Yes. Um, you can find me at uh, Carrie the Three. I'll put this in the chat channel. That's my email address, or you can find me at carrythe3.ca is my website, so you can always track me down through there. You can find me on LinkedIn, Laura, uh, Laura Vaughn, all the usual, all the usual places. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, awesome. Well, um, thanks again for speaking. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Alex. No problem. Appreciate it's it. great to have you back. Thanks. Yep. Bye. Bye for now.